Uh, first of all, I want to thank my family for what they have built and uh, what it will be in the future. And thank Tuele to give me the last spot of the day as a lecture about uh, the new concept of the subperiosteal implants. Yes, because uh, subperiosteal implants uh, as living a new life. Uh, I could say that uh, it's uh, a sort of uh, chance of redemption as uh, prosthetic uh, rehabilitation thanks uh, to the digital revolution. I'm quite sure that uh, everyone uh, knows uh, that uh, dental implants provide uh, a predictable solution uh, for uh, prosthetic uh, rehabilitation of edentulous patients with a night rate of success in medium and long term. If we take a look at the literature, we will find out that uh, implants with conomorphs connection, like the BAB dental connection is, well, actually, implants with a conomorphs connection has a rate of success around 96% after 20 years. And I'm quite sure that, like we can find out in the article of Mangano, and I'm quite sure that everyone knows that uh, to place implant, it's required an adequate quantity and quality of bone. At least uh, 1.5 millimeter uh, of uh, residual bone around the body of the implants and 2 millimeter of safety distance from uh, anatomical structures and the neighboring components. In your daily practice, uh, you will uh, meet uh, patients with uh, enough bone to place any type of implant, standard implant, long implants. But you will also meet patients with not enough bone to place any type of implants. All right? Especially a patient that uh, has lost teeth from, for a long time, from a long time, like this patient here. I mean, I cannot place any implant if at first I don't manage the bone situation, the heart tissues. Which option do I have? Well, actually, I've got two options. The first option is the regenerative approach. In the regenerative approach, um, several surgical techniques have been proposed during the year to allow, to allow us uh, the placement of uh, uh, implants immediately or uh, in a second stage. We are talking, we are talking about techniques like uh, uh, bridge uh, augmentation crest, uh, in lay on lay crest uh, um, grafting material, GBR, uh, destruction uh, osteogenesis, uh, and uh, sinus lift. And all these uh, techniques uh, use different materials. I mean, you can work with uh, homologous grafting material from the patient, heterologous grafting material uh, from, uh, bo like, bovine bone, uh, synthetic uh, grafting material, natural grafting material, like the Novocor, covered with uh, membrane, reassorbable and not reassorbable. It's up to you. The second option is the non-regenerative approach. The non-regenerative approach works on the type of implant and inclination of the implant. I mean, you can use narrow implant, you can use mini implant, you can choose a, a short implant, tilted implant, zygomatic implant, and pterygomaxillary implants. And uh, what about the literature? Does the literature support the non-regenerative approach? Well, yes, it does. I mean, uh, short dental implants uh, are an alternative as long implant with uh, bone augmentation. After 10 years, they have shown uh, less marginal bone loose, fewer post-operative uh, complication, and no implant failure differences if we compare to uh, a <coughs> technique of augmentation plus a long implant. What about the narrow implant? Uh, narrow implant uh, has shown uh, a rate of success around 95% uh, after four years for mini implants and a rate of success around 96% for mini uh, short implant uh, 
sorry, narrow implant with diameter smaller than 3.5 millimeter. That is uh, actually a rate of success that looks, that is similar to the standard implants. What about uh, the angled implant? The angled implant uh, are an alternative to the bone grafting. They have shown uh, after 12 years a rate of success around 95% and a marginal bone lose, loss uh, similar to the implant that we place axially. According to Mitch and Judy classification, we got four divisions of bone we can work with. And we would always like to work with the division A. I mean, I got enough bone to place any type of implants, standard implants. But unfortunately, unfortunately we have to work also with other division. Division B, uh, barely adequate. I mean, I've got uh, heights, but not widths. So what can I do in this case? Well, actually, in this case, I c I've got the two options that I told you before, the regenerative option or the non-regenerative option. But what when I have to deal with division C and division D? When I've got uh, a severe atrophy, I mean, I just have uh, uh, the basal bone and maybe the alveolar bone looks like uh, a sword, look, looks like a knife uh, blade. In case of uh, severe division C and uh, D, where, as you can see from this image, I don't have trabecular bone, but just cortical bone, we have to say, in my opinion, that not always the regenerative solution uh, works. I mean, I cannot uh, be sure that uh, if I do a regeneration here, it's going to be everything okay. And maybe I don't want to wait at least one year before loading the case because this is the time required by a regeneration plus uh, long implants. And maybe uh, the patient cannot afford a regeneration and long implants. Well, actually, for all this reason, uh, how can I treat a case like this where I cannot even use short implant or narrow implant? What can I do? Today, we can use the subperiosteal implants. What is it, a subperiosteal implant? A subperiosteal implant is a type of implant that uh, is placed between the periosteum and the residual alveolar bone. From two to six transmucosal elements that we better know as abutments are projected through, through the mucus and are connected to the prosthesis. Yes, because when we talk about the superiosteal implant, you have to think about a uh, um, prosthesis that is going to be loaded immediately. Just a bit of history to know that before the endosseous implants, uh, the, um, the um, fixed prosthesis were possible thanks to the superiosteal implant. Yes, because this technique is really, really old, almost 80 years old. We are in the 40s, and Dal is the father of this technique. But the first publication we find is uh, in the USA by Goldberg and Jerkov in the 50s. And for almost uh, uh, 20 years, they enjoyed a very, uh, a quite popularity, good popularity, until uh, someone else came out with uh, his idea of fixed prosthesis over endosseous implants. So what's happened? It happens that uh, we started to forget about the superiosteal implant. No, nobody has talked anymore about the superiosteal implant. Superiosteal implant lost, lose, lost um, uh, appeal on the dentistry world. Why? Because of the technique. The technique, uh, it's really complex. I mean, this technique requires the two surgical section. The first surgical section just to take the impression of the bone site. The second session is, uh, after one month, uh, the positioning of the superiosteal framework. And you have to open a big flap. You have to have uh, a large skeletalization of the area just to take the impression. Once that we have taken the impression, we can send it to our technician for uh, the preparation, the fabrication of the framework. And uh, uh, actually, if we have a problem during the impression taken or 
uh, during uh, the fabrication and the fitting of the superiostial structure is not right, I mean, is not ideal, what is going to happen that, uh, is that we are going to have uh, a resorption of the bone, bone decupitus, explosion of the structure, and uh, finally the failure of the case. This is a big problem. Also, remember one, look at this picture. In this picture you see this structure is screw retainer, but uh, retained. But at the beginning uh, the structure was not screw retained. The retention was made thanks uh, to the undercut, to the anatomy of the bone. And micro movement under the masticatory load can cause, again, uh, resorption of the bone, bone decupitus, um, exposure of the um, superiostial framework and failure of the case. Moreover, we are in the 50s. What does it mean that the knowledge about the sterilization is dif was different? And so, it there were a high risk of operative infection pre- and post-operative surgery. What about the rate of success? I check for uh, uh, publication, and I'm, I found out some public, uh, publication that comes out in the 80s. In the 80s, uh, after 10 years for Goldberg, uh, the rate of success is around 36%, while for uh, uh, Bodine, at the same time, after 30 years, the, rate, uh, the range of success is around 54%. So why, so you, uh, may, maybe you can ask you to yourself or to, to me, why do we have to talk about a technique that has a so low range of success? Well, because uh, sometimes it's uh, not possible to place uh, any other, uh, to give any other option to our technician, to our patients, uh, if we want to, uh, have uh, if he required a fixed prosthesis. I mean, in this case, uh, the standard uh, implants uh, doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the, narrow, the narrow implant. I'm not sure about the regenerative uh, solution, and I'm going to tell you why. And, uh, and for all these reasons, and one more, the most important things, uh, today we can talk about the superiosteal implant. And this reason is the digital approach. What do I mean when I talk about the digital approach? I mean that today we don't need any other uh, materials than files to work to get an entire prosthetic rehabilitation and the subperiosteal framework. History of medicine has always been made by challenge, research, and pledge. Dentistry has actually lived in a big change, thanks to the powerful impact of the digital revolution. Today we can get uh, uh, the virtual imaging of the bone, thanks to the CT Combine. We can design a smile, thanks to a software. We can take an impression, virtual impression, thanks to the extraoral scanner. And, when, and also, we can perform a surgery thanks to a surgical uh, software. Thanks to the CAD CAM solution, I'm going to create uh, in the virtual world the design of uh, a prosthesis, of uh, um, uh, the framework of the subperiosteal implant. I can, uh, I can get uh, uh, the surgical template. And thanks to machineries, the CAM part, I'm going to get all these things, from the virtual to the real. This is really important, because uh, digital revolution has opened up new perspective. And what better imagine to explain to you what is going to happen today when we talk about the superiosteal implant that, uh, talking, uh, that using this imagine, I mean uh, the telephone revolution. Because what we talk about today when we talk about the superiosteal implant, we talk about this structure. Starting from the plaster model, that is not a plaster model anymore, but is a plastic model, we got the perfect reproduction of the anatomy of the bone. And uh, also the material of this, uh, the, the superperiosteal framework is different, okay? The retention is different, but, but most important things, uh, I ju it's just required one single surgical section. 
I mean, just the positioning, the, the time what, where we are going to position uh, the subperiosteal framework. Yes, because what about the impression? The impression today is virtual. The impression is taken thanks to the CT combine. And uh, also, uh, the fabrication is at first virtual thanks to the CAD, and in a second time is going to be real thanks to the CAM, the machineries. And the workflow is uh, so precise uh, that uh, we are going to get uh, a structure that uh, fits perfectly, ideally over the recipient bone site. And this is really important for the clinical outcomes. Moreover, uh, the knowledge about the sterilization we have today are uh, higher than we had before, so low risk of operative infection pre- and post-surgery. Now, what do I have to do to get this structure? Before the surgery, you have just to collect information files. First of all, uh, the impression. The impression, as I told you before, is virtual, because you take the impression with the CT con bin, imagine. Second, the occlusion. The technician needs an occlusion to decide the position of the abutments. So, also in this case, it's uh, virtual. How can I get it? I can get with uh, the extraoral scanner or a CT con bin. Uh, Alan has, explain, has explained it before, uh, when you can use uh, one and the other. Anyway, once that you got this information, this virtual information, occlusion and uh, the impression, bone impression, uh, virtual bone impression of the patients, the technician is going to match these two information and is going to use a software to design the superior cell framework, uh, framework the product and the prosthesis. The production is thanks to 3D printer. With the 3D printer, I'm going to get uh, the stereolithographic model of the, of the patients and the surgical template. Uh, with uh, the laser sintering machine, I'm going to get the metal structure of the superiosteal implant. And with the, a milli machine, the prosthesis. Let's see a case. So, and uh, actually, <clears throat> She's a woman, she came to our clinic asking for a solution to her case. And uh, it's uh, a quite difficult case because of the fact that in the second, second quadrant she doesn't have any bone, especially in the premolar and molar area. And usually we don't think uh, uh, that uh, the subperiosteal implant can be uh, a, um, a possibility as a first option for the uh, prosthetic resolu as a prosthetic resolution. So what we decided to do is uh, a regeneration approach. I mean, what we decided uh, to do was uh, opening a big, a big flap with two deep uh, lateral release, uh, big skeletalization. We use uh, heterologous material. I mean, uh, uh, we uh, fill all uh, the area up uh, with uh, grafting material making hole over the buccal flanges uh, for the connection of the trabecular bone with uh, the grafting material. And uh, once that we filled, uh, with, we filled up all the, the area with this grafting material, and we use a lot of grafting material because we expected uh, a big regeneration. We opened a big regeneration. Uh, we, cover, we cover everything with uh, um, membrane, reassorbable membrane, and we cover, and, and, we, and we close with stitches. What we did was waiting six months. And uh, now I'm going to show you <coughs> what we add after six months, because as I told you before, as first option, I think that everyone thinks, okay, I can regenerate. This is, this is the imagine after six months. I mean, I got a regeneration uh, in the anterior part, uh, a little bit, uh, okay, where there is a trabecular bone, maybe. But actually, if I go uh, behind, I mean, uh, in the premolar and molar area, I can see that uh, I had nothing, okay? So I didn't, after six months, I didn't have 
anything, any bone to place, any implant that could support a good prosthesis that allowed the patient to have a good ma uh, mastication. Okay? And uh, now I'm ending. <laughs> Okay. So we thought uh, maybe we could have uh, <laughs> used from the beginning the superior cell option. Okay. And this is what we did. We sent uh, the CT combine to our technician, and you have to send also you have to send also the radiological template that you can get this virtual imaging by the CT combine or the extraoral scanner. It's up to you and the case. And once that the technician has got uh, the virtual imaging of the bone and the virtual imaging of the occlusion, the radiological template of the patients, he can match these two imaging together to work on a software and decide what? The design of this uh, structure. Okay, now let's talk about uh, uh, the structure. I mean, uh, the superior steel implant has got, uh, we can say, three parts. One part is uh, buccal, another part is uh, lingual or uh, palatal, and uh, the last part is crestal. The buccal and the palatal part fits over the bone. The crestal part fits its bone level. What does it mean? It means that we have to uh, prepare with drills okay, the crestal bone site, the assing for the superior cell meshes. And the preparation, remember, uh, have to have uh, uh, rounded angle have to be done with uh, a diamond drill uh, and have to have a rounded angle, not sharp angle. Why? Because under the masticatory load, sharp angle can cause resorption. And also the structure that uh, Alan is going to design is going to have rounded angle, never sharp angle. What about the thickness? If we uh, search in the literature, we will find out uh, articles about uh, uh, the thickness that this structure has to have to allow the, uh, the, superior, uh, the periosteum to attach, to attach again over the structure. And it has to be less than two millimeter. Actually, our structure has a uh, um, uh, thickness uh, around 0 0.8, 1.1 millimeter. And uh, these uh, holes that, you, uh, that uh, Alan is designed are the holes uh, where the screw, the mini screw, are going to fix uh, the um, uh, superperiosteal framework. The mini screw are titanium mini screw. This structure is titanium alloy grade 5. And the screw as well, the mini screw as well, it's titanium alloy grade uh, 5. So, you have to think about the mini screw as uh, um, mini short implants because the dimension is 2.1, 2.3. So, the, uh, the behavior will be like uh, the implant at first uh, um, connection uh, physical and in a second time is going to be, uh, we can say, biological, natural. Uh, now, um, we will, see, we will wait just a few moments because uh, you will see how uh, the technician is going to place the abutment. These are the abutments, the transmucosal part, the part that crossed through the mucus and uh, uh, allowed to be the prosthesis to be connected with all the structure. Move on. This is the, imagine, the virtual imaging. And this is the real imagine. We pass through the CAD production to the CAD, from the CAD production to the CAM production. The entire process has got what? What, what has got? What does, what does it have? It has a, a printed bone model. The printed bone mole, model, it's a stereolithographic model of the anatomy of the patient, it facilitates and improves implant uh, planning and intraoperative efficiency. 
minimizing intraoperative and postoperative morbidity, and improving predictability of clinical outcomes. Yes, because when you have the uh, maxillary of the patient on your hand, you have the visibility of all the area, and you know in advance where you are going and how you are going to perform your surgery. 3D printed surgical template. The printed surgical template, uh, it's a template, a radiological, a surgical template that guides you in the preparation of the transversal crestal part of the bone site, giving you the exact distance of the superiosteal meshes, facilitating and optimizing the fitting of the superiosteal structure over the crestal bone. Plastic superiosteal implant copy. What is it? It's a copy of the structure, the metal structure, and it allowed me to verify uh, the precision of the preparation of the bone site and checking the adaptation of the superiosteal implants. Finally, the superiosteal framework. The superiosteal framework is uh, a custom-made direct metal laser sintering titanium superiosteal framework, it's very long, Titanium alloy grade 5, it's stronger than the pure, the pure titanium and it's resistant to the corrosion. It's virtually designed and uh, it's fabricated thanks to the laser sintering. And again, uh, the workflow is so precise that the fitting of the structure is going to be ideal, ideally uh, perfectly, uh, perfect over the uh, recipient bone site. Temporary cemented prosthesis, finally. The temporary pro uh, cemented prosthesis, uh, it's a polymethyl metacrylate. It's indicated, okay? It's uh, acrylic, it's better known as uh, acry acrylic glass. It's metal free. It's strong and tough. And uh, the most important things, the two most important things, is relined, uh, is relinable and reprintable. I mean, if I got a problem, I can fix this problem with uh, composite or uh, reprinted all the structure. And it cost, uh, it has a very low cost for me and for the passion as well. And you have to think about this uh, uh, material as a long-term uh, long temporary prosthetic solution. So, in the end, what do I have? I've got uh, the bone, 3D bone, the 3D bone model patient, the surgery guide, the copy of the structure, the um, prosthesis, uh, and the superior framework. Just to show you one case, this is uh, uh, one, uh, the, the case, it's a maxilla, and uh, uh, we open you, it's required um, a very big skeletalization of the area. Uh, so I'm going to open a wide crest with a wide crestal incision, a full thickness uh, flap. With two deep uh, releasing incision, measuring and distal, I can open a big uh, flap to have a great visibility of this uh, area. This is really, really important. And then I'm going to prepare the assing for the implant sites. Uh, the assing for the implant site, for the um, superiosteal crestal meshes uh, are made thanks to the surgical template that guides you in the preparation of the transversal crestal bone, giving me the exact distance between the uh, meshes. Okay? And uh, with the copy, I'm going to check to verify the positioning of the superiosteal structure and the preparation that I've done with uh, uh, the drill. Actually, in this case, we use uh, a drill. Uh, um, you can use a diamond drill, or you, we use uh, a flattener drill from the surgical uh, kit, uh, the guided kit. And uh, I remember you, um, the preparation has to have always uh, rounded angle, not uh, um, sharp angle. This is really important. Then I go with the adaptation, I check the adaptation of the structure. Once uh, that uh, I, I've placed uh, the structure, 
I can go with uh, uh, the preparation, the fixing of uh, the fixation of the, this uh, uh, framework. And the fixation is made thanks to uh, one drill, the last drill, that is going to prepare the pads for uh, the mini screw. As I told you before, the mini screw has to be thought as uh, uh, mini implants, mini short implants, we can say. Because uh, the dimension is 2.1 for the, f uh, for the standard solution. And uh, if it doesn't fit really well, you can use the 2.3, the safety, we, can, we call uh, them the safety mini screws. Uh, they are titanium grade 5. Uh, the torque insertion you have to reach, uh, if you can, uh, it's almost 40. Uh, Newton and lens okay I said four uh, six eight ten and twelve okay let's move on we got screw in the palatal flange and we got screw also in the buccal flange I'm so I'm I'm sorry it's changing my presentation <laughs> but anyway uh, we finish uh, the case uh, cover uh, with uh, uh, the graphite material. We cover all the um, structure with uh, uh, this uh, graphite material. Why? Because we want to help the natural coverage that is going to happen in one year uh, or the, the year before. Um, and so we, we use the graphite material. This is the imagine after the surgery stitches. We took uh, a CT combin to check uh, the fitting of the structure, uh, looking for the right fitting of the structure, the right preparation, uh, the screw, uh, where, the, where do they go, and uh, everything was okay. Post-surgery, imagine. One week later, Three weeks later. Okay, the healing is uh, still going on. It's not beautiful, but uh, it's still going on. Polymethylmetacrylate uh, structure in the mouth of the patient. Three months later, uh, actually, we have no inflammation. Uh, the aesthetic uh, is quite good. Uh, think that she, doesn't, she didn't have anything before. And uh, the healing is still going on, but the papilla is still growing, okay? This is the patient. There is no audio, but uh, she said uh, that she is now happy. She can smile. She can have a social life. Uh, and you can see the difference uh, before and now. And uh, it, it came out really quite good. So... Uh, the digital revolution has given up a new life uh, to the superiosteal implant. Superiosteal implant dressed, uh, has dressed uh, a new clothes. And uh, now they have the chance uh, to have a uh, um, new life. Uh, as prosthetic uh, resolution. That works, uh, actually. So, my dear doctor, this is the end of the presentation. Hope you enjoy. Yeah.